Welcome back to Accent Your Beauty. You know, since we've been doing this show, we've been getting so many calls, texts, emails with your questions at home about different procedures, things that you would like to ask the doctor if you could sit down with him. So tonight's going to be kind of an online consultation for you at home, and we're going to answer some of your questions. But before we do that, Dr. Berkowitz and I are going to talk about something that's been in the news recently. And that's these vampire facials and how you better go to the right person or you'll end up either looking like a vampire, being eaten by a vampire, or wishing that you had been. <laughs> Dr. Berkowitz, tell us what happened in Mexico. So it actually was in New Mexico, in the United States. Oh, it was here. It was in the United States. And so people who received the vampire facial received a call back from the clinic that they now need to be tested for bloodborne diseases. Bloodborne diseases, diseases like, like HIV, HIV, hepatitis. Hepati that's not that's good. That's a nightmare. And yeah. it, sh it should never happen. So and how did it happen? So the problem is in the United States, every state regulates clinics differently. And so in some states, only the doctor can perform injections. In other states like Michigan, you can have a nurse perform it. And there are some states where you don't even have to be a doctor or a nurse, the so way the rules a, are written. A facialist or someone at a home party could do it? Yeah, yeah that's uh, not it, good. It, it's terrible. And so while the FDA does not regulate the drawing of your blood, because it's your own blood, it's, it's like regulating saliva or urine. Yeah, another, <laughs> another bodily fluid. <laughs> fluid. However, so, taking it out, spinning it, and then replacing so the platelets, that should be regulated. Yeah, so they don't look at that, but they look at the machinery. So there's machinery called a centrifuge that spins. Now, when we perform the vampire face lift or facial, it's done in a centrifuge that's closed. And so your blood goes directly into a tube that cannot be put with anybody else's blood, can't touch anybody else's blood, it's impossible for your blood to be contaminated, and so it's a very safe procedure. As Plus, matter you're there, and there's a doctor there, and it's overseeing everything. Controlled. Correct, but there are unfortunately people who are only looking to make money off of the name. They're not, you know. Is that the real name though? Is it really called the Vampire Facial? Is so, that the name? So it is. So, Dr. Charles Runnels and he did a lot of research. So what he was looking at was there were so many different people out there who were performing uh, fillers, and he said, you know what, there's gotta be a better way, and he looked and he saw that using something called platelet-rich plasma, which is your own blood spun out in a special method that creates these platelets that then have growth factors that can be injected back when he went to quite a bit of expense and time to formulate the correct formulation for both your blood along with fillers and injecting it. And so he was the father of the vampire facial. He actually father, trademarked it. <laughs> Godfather of vampire facials. Joke. We'll call him Dr. Dracula. Yeah, and so he'd probably laugh at that. And so he put on workshops and continues to, and teaches other doctors how to properly perform it. Unfortunately, because the name has become so popular, like Kleenex, people right. are just using that name, but they've never been taught how to perform it. They just, you know, unfortunately, sometimes just take your own blood, spin it in a, n an open system, and that's where blood can be so contaminated. So it's like cross-contamination. Yeah. And that causes all kinds of, and that you can, can either get infections as well, right? Right, and, and the, the ironic part is, Platelet-rich plasma is actually used to treat and decrease inflammation. There's never been an infection from PRP. There's thousands of studies looking at platelet-rich plasma. So this is, unfortunately, some people who only were looking at how do they can make a buck off of other people, not looking to help people, and in an unregulated office performing this procedure. Well, I think people have to be very careful when they do any kind of a procedure 
but specifically when you're dealing with puncturing the skin and dealing with putting your blood back in, mm -hmm. you want someone who knows what they're doing. You should check that out the same way women check out a hairdresser, they check out a, an attorney when they're getting a divorce. You should check out. They spend more time looking at who their hairdresser is exactly. than who's injecting them. Right. And they don't ask, they don't ask, you know, what products are being used. You, when you're having a product injected, you should actually see it come out of the box. You should see it coming out of the box and know exactly what you're receiving. And I, I can't tell you the number of people who come to me after seeing other doctors and other clinics and I ask, well, you know, what did you have done? They have no idea of their history. Well, then they didn't do their homework very yeah. well because that's something you should know at all times. Now, if you don't see, I think a lot of times you go into a, a doctor's office and uh, the syringe is already there filled with whatever they're putting in. You never saw the brand name. They tell you it's, let's say, Juvederm, but mm -hmm. how do you know that that's what it is if you don't see it yeah. come out of so that box? So a, a few things. I mean, number one, when I inject, I always have the boxes there and the, I take them out at the time. Perfect. That's so, the way So it they can be. see. The, with Botox, because Botox can be used and really has to be reconstituted beforehand, we keep the bottle and the box still there with the syringes too. So people can look, they can see when it is, and we write the date and who and who took reconstituted it as well. So everything is known about every injectable that we do. Well, that brings up a question I always wondered is, let's say I come to you and I want, uh, let's say Juvederm, that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Sure. And we use up one syringe and we go into the second syringe, but we don't use all of it. Mm -hmm. Can that be stored and saved so I can use it the next time? Once it's open, it's like a sugar and bacteria love it. And so once it's open, it's prone to be like a Petri dish. Okay. And so it can't be shared. It can't be saved for later. So you can't bring in a friend and each share a syringe no. of it, it can't so be done that way. The it, product is for one person, person and one time only use. Correct. But one syringe is one fifth of a teaspoon. And usually let's say somebody's coming in for their lips and they need one, you know, syringe within their lips itself. I can always find an area that they're going to find very natural and beautiful and youthful. By, it doesn't by get placing. wasted then. It, get, it will not get There's wasted. There's always a place. There's always and, a place. And when they hold up that magnifying mirror and say, what do you see? You'll find a place to put there, it. There's always a place that's, for injectable. That's for sure. So, so the vampire facial, to give you a little idea, you know, what it does. So basically, as you said before, it, it is Juvederm normally, which is the most popular filler made by Allegan, along with your own blood. And so the filler is used to create volume, while the platelet-rich plasma, the vampire part of it, that is there to improve texture of the skin, to help in the healing, and can be used to fill as well. And that's different, you know, than a vampire facelift, where we usually use more filler. In the facial, it's actually placed more upon the skin to improve the skin, maybe done along with microneedling as well to help channel and to place the, uh, both the filler as well as the platelets into the skin. You know, when somebody buys a product with growth hormone that they're putting on to their skin, they're basically just one factor is placed. What people don't realize is your own blood has so many more of these factors. So when you're getting it injected, the goodness that is there is far exceeds anything topical that's out there that is made by the industry. And there's some great products that well, I love. It, not to interrupt, but explain with the vampire facial. Now, they're injecting the blood, your own blood, your own is blood. mixed with Juvederm. See, I didn't know that that's part so, of the components that go back into your face. So with it, you can do a few different things. You can if you're just doing the facial, you can place just the PRP or the platelet-rich right. plasma onto mm -hmm. the skin with channels. There's actually a way to micro needle now too, where you can inject small amounts of Juvederm into the skin simultaneously. You can even do a little bit of Botox, so we can make a mixture up and place it into the skin as so a it's mixture. It's like a little cocktail. A little cocktail. And you can a little more of this and a little, a little less more of that, that, depending on what the on person what the person's needs. looking for. So with is this mixture? 
Go ahead. Filler goes in, but I see, after I see people with the vampire facial, it looks like they have blood on their face. So they do have blood on their face depending upon the depth of the microneedling. So microneedling can be placed where you're going like 0.5 or 0.6 millimeters, where for that you may get a little bit of spotting, or I can go much deeper and do microneedling even in the operating room where I'm going 1.4 millimeters, and I am creating these little channels that create bleeding. For the majority of people, the next day, their skin is already looking great. And so the blood that you see on their face isn't, wasn't put there, it's what came out when it, it was needled in. Correct. I always thought they splashed the blood on the outside of the yeah. face, but it's coming because it's actually, your own natural bleeding. That's correct, because when we spin out your blood and get that platelet, it actually is no longer red. It's more of a clearish yellow solution that's placed upon the skin. Oh. And so when the micro channels are made, it's your actual skin bleeding. And then we're placing this to go into the channels. And, and there's only a, sum, a select amount of time that the PRP can get into these channels. And studies show it's minimally 30 minutes. And some people believe up to 24 hours where you can get these cosmeceuticals into the skin. But I think it's more around the 30 minute. Mark. So when you see the blood, that's the blood that's coming out of the needle. Mark. Correct. So you don't wipe it off as you go along. No, yes. I, I actually leave that on because your own blood has healing factors and a cascade within it to help in the healing. So we want that to be part of the healing process to help build the collagen for you and help create. So how do you see skin. where to do the needling when it's just all blood? So it, it's not that bad. So okay. uh, unfortunately, you know, when Kim Kardashian had it performed, um, she did not look great afterwards because I think they went a little bit deeper than she needed. Most people, it, it doesn't look like a car wreck. Okay, <laughs> so there might be little dots here and there. Correct. Blood, but your whole face doesn't look like you just went through a windshield. No, for the, for the normal PRP that people are going through with microneedling, you may see a few little dots here or there, but it's not this bleeding that you look and say, my God, what just happened to them? Now, can we go that deep? We can, and, and for certain people, we do go that deep, but they're well aware of that, and they need a little bit more downtime. But usually it's within 24, 48 hours that you know, they're in makeup already. How would you compare it to a light peel? What's the difference between uh, a, a peel, a resurfacing, mm -hmm. and a vampire So facial? it's a great question. So you know, with peels, we can go to different levels. So we can use glycolics where we're doing a, a lighter peel. There are deeper glycolics too, salicylics. And then there are even deeper peels like phenol peels that mm -hmm. can go quite deep and make tremendous changes. So the vampire facial, I would say, is equal to like a deep glycolic peel. And the beauty is that you can you know, see exactly where you're placing. With a glycolic peel, sometimes it can go deeper than you'd like or maybe too superficial. And I actually like the vampire better because I know the depth I'm going to. Plus, I'm putting in the healing factors as well. So I think the person gets more of a uh, peaches and cream kind of look to their skin a little bit faster. What's the price comparison? Like, how much is the vampire facial? And how much is the peel you were talking about, so, the resurfacing? So the peels can run anywhere between a, a home peel that we, we're sending you home with can run a few dollars to one that you're doing in the office that can be a few hundred dollars, depending on the depth we're going to. A vampire facial runs several hundred dollars mm -hmm. to you know just over a thousand, depending if, if we're using filler along with it too or if we're doing a vampire facelift and placing even more filler as well. Um, but there's more benefit to the, the vampire. Okay, question. Go ahead. Which one is there more downtime or less downtime? Because a lot of people we, think if they work about the same, which one am I going to look better the next day and go back to work? Yeah, so we can customize it. So there are peels that we can do where you have it performed and you can go back to work and be in makeup the next day. With a vampire facial, I'd want you to have 24 hours available. So uh, stay home the whole next day. Yeah, I'd like but to But then have the day after you can apply you makeup able, and go yeah, to work. Yeah, for the majority of people. Okay, okay. well I hope that answered the questions about
you know, whether or not you're going to get HIV, getting a vampire facial. Not in Michigan and not with Dr. Berkowitz. So, should we get to some of our questions? Because we have, look at them all. We have, have a lot of questions, I, I, which means a lot of people have been watching and, and have questions for us, so I like that. But before we do, I, I'd like to say, so as far as this book is concerned, so first of all, you can come on in, and I'm there to educate whether you choose me or not, and I hope you do. I'm there to educate. But part of the questions that people have, if they want this book, they just let us know, come in, and they can take this book home, read through it. And when people read through this book, they come right back in for the vampire facial. And so it's, it's I'm quite taking interesting. It home tonight and read you it. can. Leave it right there. I I'm taking it home with me. Before we get to the questions, I just want to say that I intend to have everything we're talking about so that I can tell you about it. So before we get started on the questions, I want to talk a little bit about that hydrofacial that we spoke about in an earlier show. So I went in and had this done. And I have to say, it was the best facial I have ever had. They start out by cleaning the skin, almost like sucking. They suck off layers and exfoliate. Felt wonderful. Just like this big Very vacuum. Cat's dung. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> then they used like a microdermabrasion with crystals mm -hmm. and cleaned everything out, took off a top layer. Then I think the third step was they sucked out blackheads and whiteheads that I didn't even know I had. And they sucked them all out. And the best part was at the end, you could see what was sucked out of your skin. You could actually you could look into the jar, you could look and, into see the jar and see all the tiny little blackheads floating around, hopefully not too many. And then they finish up with serums and, and different uh, And the serums could be customized. Yes, so, depending so it depends, if you have dry skin or correct. oily skin or whatever. And then at the end, um, you can have a skin analysis done where they will tell you exactly the condition of your skin. But I have to say it was the most wonderful facial. It was probably a half hour, mm -hmm. 40 minutes. And I left there and I looked like a new baby. Yeah, I mean, Just your skin feels skin. great. It did. It, yeah. feel, it felt great. Everybody was touching my skin and saying, <laughs> what did you do? I didn't even need makeup. That's how great it was. So I would recommend that to anyone. And next I'm going to get a vampire treatment and get that facial. And I'll tell you about that one. So when we come back, we're going to get to our questions. We'll be right back. Ah, low budget movie version. 60s TV version. Early 2000s high school pseudo adaption that eventually grows into the geek we all know and love version. I'm getting paid a lot of money to be here, so listen up. Watch the Geektainment channel on NewRadioMedia.com. It's geek approved. It's all about you, and that's the way we like it. Where you're going. What you do to stay fit. What you're eating. What you're thinking. And how you're feeling. Join the conversation at NewRadioMedia.com's Lifestyles channel. Stream the life you want to live. Detroit. It's the home of some of the world's most talented artists. It's where techno and Motown were born. It's a city where you can experience raw, untamed rock and roll. I'm Ben Rose, and I'm inviting you to join me weekday afternoons from 4 to 5 for the Motor City Juke Joint. I'll have interviews with musicians, info on what's going on around town, and a playlist curated by me just for you. It's all right here on NewRadioMedia.com. Do you want to see things like this? Did you just say you died? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, technically. Or maybe even something like this. We'll do nothing but destroy your corpses and burn them all for my dogs. Your dogs are gone. And sometimes, a little of this. We need to have a talk. <laughs> I take my axe and I smash it. No! <laughs> and check out Podquesters, the show where we tackle ghoulish goblins, fiendish foes, and dangerous drakes. Oh, like the singer? No, the dragon creature. Oh. Anyways, Podquesters, Fridays, only on NewRadioMedia.com.
Okay, we're back with some of your questions, and there's some good ones here, Doc. Right. So I hope you're ready to answer all these, because right. I want to know the answers, too, because some of these kind of apply to me as well. But uh, this is a friend of mine here in West Bloomfield who wants to know, if she does Juvederm for the eye hollowness, you know, mm -hmm. underneath the eyes, before she goes in and has um, that laser, laser, the ablative mm -hmm. laser, is that going to affect the Juvederm? So which should go first? Okay, so as far as that's concerned, number one, the laser does not go as deep as the Juvederm is placed. So it's not going to hurt the Juvederm. But my bigger question for her is, why is she allowing Juvederm to be placed in her lower lids? Juvederm is a great filler for the lips because it loves water. And so it creates a luscious lip. But the lower lid is the thinnest skin in the body. Well, I don't think she meant the eyelid. I think you, she meant, the, the is that a lid underneath? Yeah, so this is the lower lid. Okay. And so she was saying like the tear trough yeah, area. Yeah, that little hollow and area so that, that we all hollow, get. Juvederm is not the best filler for that area because it will take on fluid. And oh, then so it might get puffy looking. might get puffy. Plus, it can create this effect called the Tyndall effect. The Tyndall effect's a bluish discoloration. Okay, we don't want lid. that one. So we don't want to do that. So, but there are better fillers. So there's a filler called Bellatero that can be used I've there. I've heard about that one. Your own body fat can be used there. Volbella can be used there. They're made is for that area. Is there one called Voluma too? So Voluma is a perfect filler for the cheeks. Okay. So Voluma and Volbella and Juvederm, they're all cousins all made by Allergan. And they all have their specific areas to go. Um, so for your friend, what I would say is, Let's not place Juvederm. Let's place something a little bit softer and like Bellatero Volbella. And don't worry about doing the laser. It could be done before or after. But if she were my friend, I would do the laser first. Oh, you would do the laser first? I would do the first. laser first because... See how you like that result. Right, because you're going to get tightening in that junction between the lower lid and the cheek. And it may be enough that you can avoid filler altogether in the lower lid area. Well, I'm glad she asked me that because she yeah. was going to go ahead, get the filler, and then do the laser. So that probably wouldn't have given her the result she wants. Probably not giving her the exact result, especially if she used Juvederm. And Juvederm's a great filler. In the right places. In the right places. So what, and again, I always ask price because everyone asks me price. So to do the laser is about how much? So depending on how deep we go, some of the lasers that are not as deep, like a fractional laser, can run between $800 and $1,400 per treatment. If we're going deep and I'm going into the operating room, it can run between $3,500 and up to seven or $8,000, depending upon the laser that I'm using for it. And why do you need both? If you're spending $5,000, why do you need to put any filler in after? Well, it depends. So certain lasers, like uh, we spoke in the passed about one called Renuvium, which used to be known as J-Plasma. That one not only tightens skin, but seems to plump the skin as well. And so that one you can get close to, for some people, almost the look of a facelift, a natural looking facelift, not a windswept facelift, right. with skin tightening at the same time. And so you may not need filler. And, and that's why I say, let's do resurfacing first for you. Let's go through the healing period, and then if you need filler, we can always place it. But if somebody came into me and they already had filler, and now they want to have resurfacing, they don't have to worry about that filler disappearing. Oh, really? Yeah. That makes it last longer? Well, it's not that it lasts longer. It's that the filler is at a deeper level than the laser goes. Okay. So it's not going to melt that filler. That's a good thing to know because I think that you should talk to you know, the doctor mm -hmm. and who's sitting right here and ask him, do you need both? Because some patients probably don't need as deep. Well, so. so what ends up happening is people will see things on TV or the internet and they'll come in saying, I want X, Y, and Z. And they're positive that it's only X, Y, and Z that's going to make the change for them. And that's why our consultation is so important because we point out for them a plan and they can choose one, two, three, X, Y, Z. Maybe they don't need X, Y, and Z. Maybe correct. It might X be the and Y will be right. just enough. enough for them. Or it's A, B, C, and X, Y, Z would have been a problem for them. Okay. My next question, I don't know the person because it came in um, email. They didn't sign the name. But they want to know, is neck liposuction possible when you're 
obese. Like if you're already a very heavy person, but you don't want that double chin, can you do that on just the chin and look so better? It's always best with any facial procedure to be at an ideal weight, okay? But very few of us are at an ideal weight. So it, we have to take a look at their BMI. We have to take a, which is their body mass index. We have to take a look at their age. We have to take a look at how they're wearing that weight, if you will. So some people can wear extra weight better than others. So can they have a procedure like liposuction underneath the chin? The answer is yes. But if we're not getting skin tightening at the same time, so we're just removing fat, they may have excess skin in that area too. So now instead of a double chin, they have the turkey neck. They can have a turkey neck. They have the neck. little wobble thing right. hanging there. So we have to make sure that, number one, if we're removing fat, is there a skin turgor enough that it will snap back or do we have to do something else like use a laser underneath the skin to help tighten the skin for them? Or is it really that they need a facelift because sometimes that fullness is related to a muscle called the platysma right. that starts here and ends here mm -hmm. and that platysma basically needs to be tightened too. So without seeing this person, it's impossible to say yes or no, but the answer is a definite maybe that it can be done for them and we can remove fatty tissue, but we have to see if it's the right process for them. Yeah, because you don't want to fix one problem and create another problem. So now we remove the fat, now you've got all this hanging skin. Correct. So you could have fixed both by just a lower facelift. If that's what they need, or some, again, some lasers can be used to tighten the skin simultaneously. And you know, when somebody says obese, their BMI may be 30, 31, and, and while that's considered obese, they may still be an excellent candidate just for neck liposuction. Well, it's good to know because you want to know what your options are. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one here was a text to me, and they want to know if the uh, radio frequency, now this doesn't make right. sense to me, but on the forehead, is it the same as a brow lift? If you get that radio frequency right. on your forehead, will that tighten it and lift? So radio frequency, one of the first procedures that came out is one called thermage. Uh, that can use, be used to tighten the skin. And there are many different types of radio frequency now. The brow is actually very heavy for most people. And so just using things like radio frequency can get tightening of the skin, but it may not be enough to lift the brow as well. When we resurface the forehead by using like a CO2 laser or the J plasma, the Renuvion, you can get even more skin tightening and get a lift. Radio frequency on its own for most people will probably not lift their brow enough to equal a brow lift. But well, let's introduce Botox to this go equation. Go ahead, perfect. Because Botox can lift the brow and it can smooth the forehead. Correct. So are some people better candidates for Botox so than the radio the frequency? The beauty of Botox is what Botox does it's a purified protein that stops muscles from squeezing. We're not trying to paralyze muscles. We still want people to make facial expression. So the reason that the brow lifts with Botox is that we're taking the muscles that pull the brow down. So in the area over here and here, these muscles are responsible for pulling the brow down. If we weaken them, then this whole muscle called the frontalis, it's responsible for lifting the brow. So it can take over and it lifts the brow and it gives a natural brow lift by reducing the downward pull of the muscles in the here. So getting rid of the 11 lines, the gabello lines, the crow's feet from the orbicularis, you relax those muscles that pull down and then the brow pulls up. Now, if that's done prior to a procedure like radiofrequency, then what you're doing is you're making it that the muscles are not pulling down and you're getting the tightening so you get a nicer change by using Botox before a procedure like radiofrequency or CO2 laser than if you did not do it. So Botox is really beautiful in conjunction with other procedures. Again, it's a mixture of what works for you. It's that old X, Y, Z. Do I need X, Y, and Z? Or can I do X and Z and maybe Ma not do I, y? I tell people all the time, you know, sometimes one plus one plus one doesn't equal three. It can equal seven or eight in regard to the changes it makes for you. So procedures can be additive. And so we find what works best in the person's budget for them as well and their downtime to make the changes they're looking for. That's 
another thing that I'm going to bring up now, because I think we discussed this on a previous mm -hmm. show, but for anyone that didn't see it, this one came in to me, and it's from um, a friend of one of my grandsons, and he's a teenage boy, and wants to know, what's the best treatment to reduce acne scarring when you've got, you know, you want to look good, you're dating, you don't want those deep little acne so, scars. So it's, again, it's the one plus one plus one, especially with acne scarring, it's multiple modalities. So there are many things that need to be done to decrease the scarring that's there. One is there's a filler, Belafil. Belafil is the only FDA approved filler for acne scars. It's made actually for an acne scar called a rolling scar, and that's where you take your fingers over the scar and you lift up and it rolls away. And so that scar is what the FDA gave approval for, but as physicians, we can use it for other scars too. And what it helps to do is build your own collagen within the scar itself. But when I'm placing something like Belafil, there's usually scar tissue, not just within that acne scar, but underneath there's like a fiber pulling down too. So I do something called subcision. And that, what that is, is it's actually breaking those bands or releasing those bands so that the scar is not pulling as much. And so that can be done at the same time as Belafil's placed within the direct scar. And most of the time people have scars in their cheek area and they lose volume because of that. So we place that volume at the same time. And Ken, before we go to break, go ahead. I wanna ask you, can you also do a light resurfacing or a light peel for that? Yes, so that's another part of the equation is a peel. And what we spoke about before, the vampire facial will help acne, will help acne as well. There you go. We're giving you all these great <laughs> tips. This is like a free consultation. <laughs> So when we come back, I have some more questions that have come in and we'll get you those answers. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you're always looking to save money and cut costs where you can. And if you advertise on radio or television, you know it can get pretty pricey. If radio and TV aren't delivering like they promised and you're looking for a more reasonably priced way to get your message to the masses, I've got an answer for you. New Radio Media. With live streaming and on-demand programming, your message can be seen throughout the day and you can worry a little less about cutting those costs. For more information, go to newradiomedia.com or call Buzz Van Houten at 248-939-9999. Raphael of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Guess what? The only thing we can get down here in the sewer is Geektainment Weekly on new radio media. Turtle power! It's all about you, and that's the way we like it. Where you're going. What you do to stay fit. What you're eating. What you're thinking. And how you're feeling. Join the conversation at newradiomedia.com's Lifestyles channel. Stream like you want to live. Dr. My eyes have seen the years and the slow parade of fears without crying. Now I'm so glad to be back answering these questions because while we were during break, I got one more texted on my phone, so I hope we'll have a chance to get to that one. But in the meantime, can you get a hair restoration procedure if you're pregnant? Now, this one tricked me because hmm. it came into your office, and a hair replacement while you're pregnant means it's a woman that's asking this question, not a guy. And, and so around 15 to 20% of our hair transplants are women coming in. And uh, it's devastating for both sexes, but you know, for, for women, it's uh, particularly devastating. I, I mean, the majority of women, when they, they come in, they're extremely emotional over the, the hair loss. 
And so with pregnancy, there's hormonal changes that can occur to cause the hair loss. And many times, once the pregnancy is over or they're, they're finished as far as breastfeeding is concerned, because that hormonally can change things too, they can regain the hair growth. So it's not the time to do a hair transplant during pregnancy. Plus, you don't want to do it during pregnancy because we've got to freeze the area. We're going to use medications to it make you comfortable. And we don't want it to affect the baby. Stream. Yeah, so it, it's not good for you. It's not good for the baby. Theoretically, can it be done? Yes, but I wouldn't perform it for you. And I, I can't think of a, a doctor who would do it. Well, that's why it was sort of looked to me like kind of a trick question because it seemed to me that mostly women that have hair loss, it might come a little bit later in life, not as young as a 25-year-old girl having a child. Mm -hmm. So that seemed like either the person that was having the hair loss was older having a child, or if it's the younger person, I lost hair when I had mm -hmm. my second child, and I panicked. Mm -hmm. You know, I went right to the dermatologist, and I said, what's happening here? It's falling out. And he said, give it six months it'll regrow mm -hmm. and it did by the time and the one year birthday party came it was all fine yeah again. it would be shameful to perform a hair transplant on a woman who's you know five months out and you were saying with young women so the other time young women end up losing hair is um, a lot of times they place traction on the hair especially certain ethnicities will braid their hair very tight Oh, and correct. if they don't let go of the braid in a you know, certain amount of time you're pulling and you're reducing blood flow and you can create scar tissue with this. And so we see a, young, a lot of young African-American women who have lost hair because of that traction that they're placing. So th that's something that I is devastating. I it's devastating to them. And, and so you have to release those braids. It's so important. I think we talked about this on a previous show also, about even ponytails, if they're too tight. They're too and tight. you wear a ponytail every single day, first of all, if you don't use the right kind of tie, if it's like a rubber band, it could cause breakage mm -hmm. where you make the ponytail so that when you let your hair down, you can see that little breakage line. Mm -hmm. Or it can seriously pull the hair out, correct? Pull the hair out, and again, just the traction can decrease the blood flow as well. So, I mean, ponytails are cute, but you've got to, you know, let go. But we're talking really the, those, especially those, those tight braids. That what about French braiding, which is kind of a more of a looser yeah, form? Yeah, it's a looser. That should be fine. That's it okay. It sh shouldn't cause any problems. And unfortunately, there is a psychological condition found mostly in women where, and especially young women, that they pull their hair out and, and they start pulling their hair, especially at nighttime. Um, I have a friend, now that you mentioned that, mm -hmm. whose daughter is going through a lot of psychological drama, mm -hmm. divorce, problems at school, and she started pulling, mm -hmm. pulling hair. She's actually created a bald spot in one particular area over her ear from just pulling. And I don't think she's aware of it. She'll be watching TV, twirling it, pulling, yeah. twirling, pulling. And, and it's not just their hair. They, they pull at their eyebrows, their eyelashes as well. So it, it can be devastating and um, they do it usually at nighttime, and it's something that uh, they, you know, need help from many times a therapist to help stop that. And we didn't even get to the issue of alopecia, which can be stress-induced as well as mm -hmm. physiological, right? Correct. I mean, you can actually cause yourself to lose hair just from worry and stress. From the buildup of cortisone within your body. So th there are, as we spoke in the past, a lot of different reasons that, you know, people lose hair. but. Uh, again, if it's during pregnancy, that's not the time to. Okay, so if you're pregnant and losing hair, bear with it. It will get better most of the time. Okay, now we have a question. Which technique is better for a facelift? Which particular <laughs> technique? Because there are so many different kinds of facelifts. There's mm -hmm. upper facelifts and lower facelifts, and there's the threading kind, and there's, th believe me, there's choices. Mm -hmm. Do you individualize it to the person? Oh, it's always customized. But, but the first thing that you brought up is the most important, and that is what the client thinks a facelift is and what the doctor thinks a facelift is. So many clients think a facelift is basically everything from neck to hairline, from a brow lift to eyelid surgery to lifting the cheeks 
to the jawline to the neck. When a doctor thinks of a facelift, we think of a lower facelift, meaning tightening along the jawline and tightening underneath the chin. It's not including the eyelids, it's not including the brow, although these things could be done at the same time. But it's and kind of like a Chinese not to be facetious, but it's like a Chinese menu. There's column A, B, and C. There is. And if you're going to just do the lower facelift, you can always add on the eyes. You can mm -hmm. add on uh, endoscopic mid facelift, mm -hmm. which is good for the cheek area, and the brow lift, of course, which lifts the brows. So there's the brows, the well, eyes, the cheeks, and the lower the face. The beauty of doing these things all at one time, it's one healing period. Because if you just, let's say, did a facelift, and you didn't do the eyelids. You need, depending upon the type of facelift, somewhere between seven and 14 days before you can go out and make up. If you just did eyelid surgery, you need seven to 10 days before you can go out. If you just did neck liposuction, you, you know, alone, you may need three or four days time. And so if you can do it all during the same healing period, again, it's one plus one plus one doesn't equal three. It can equal seven or eight or nine or 10 in regard to the changes it can make for so you. So it's like one stop shopping. Right. You know, so, so you're getting everything at one time and you're gonna heal all at one time and then you're done for 10, correct. 15 so, years. So to ask, you know, which is the best facelift, it depends upon the person. So feather lifts or basically using a stitch to lift the area. So they were popular around 15, 20 years ago then they fell out of popularity, now they've become popular again. What people need to know about them is that a stitch can only lift so much on its own. And so what ends up happening with these feather lifts are multiple stitches of what's a, called a barb stitch is placed. So the stitch actually catches underneath the skin and catches the muscle so it can be so it can but lift. But sometimes don't they show through? You can so, see. So that was a bigger problem with some of the older right. ones that are out there. The newer ones is rare that that occurs, but what people have to understand is that it's something that lasts them a year or two at most for the placement of these stitches alone. And for some people that's fine. You, you know, just like filler, you say, okay, you know, I want something that's just a year or two. I'm not looking for something that's, you know, five, 10 or 15 years time. So it's just a little maintenance in between a full facelift. You might want just you, a little. You might want that, or if you're younger and not ready for a facelift, it may be a good procedure. But unfortunately, again, there are clinics that are out there where they end up performing this for everybody. And it's not the right procedure. And that's why I, I say my, my team and I, we're not cookie cutters. We look at the individual and we customize for them. And so for one person, uh, you know, because of their budget, because of their timing, because of their age, because of their laxity, a suture lift may be enough. Now, for, I want to say when this person asks what technique do you use? Do you always cut around the front of the ear for so the lower facelift? Is that the technique every doctor uses? That's where you pull from? So normally the pull is not just a skin pull, but that's actually more of an access point, if you will. Because if you just tighten right, because if you're just tightening skin, you may look nice for maybe six months because of swelling that's there. But what has to be done is you're making that access point so that you can tighten the muscle underneath. Well, that's important for underneath because I know that the, the platysma has to be tightened. It's like a canvas, it's like a, a, a sling, isn't it? It's a sling it's and a you sling can tighten that chin. sling. And so that sling can be tightened again by stitches placed in between it like, and going back and forth like a trampoline or stitches going back and forth along the jawline or even from, again, the incision here pulling it. And so there's a lot of different ways to tighten that platysma muscle. Now, for girls who have longer hair, you don't see that. But what about the short-haired girls, or men? How do you make sure that that line isn't a dead giveaway? Because okay. that line I've seen on people be sitting next to them, and I know for sure so they had a facelift. Years ago, uh, in Michigan it was founded, there was a procedure called the lifestyle lift. And the lifestyle lift, people would have, and it was a fast procedure, people would get back to their activities quick as well. But what happened with many of these people is that the incision wasn't hidden. So the doctor would just make a quick incision in front of the ear, behind the ear, tighten skin, tighten muscle quickly, and then suture things back up and send them on their way. 
But what would happen is this would pull and would leave a scar line for them. Or it affects the lobe. It affects the lobe. The lobe gets like pulled pixelated. down. That's that correct. It becomes yeah. a pixelated ear. Right. I've and seen that too. Down. Not attractive. And so when I'm performing a facelift, I take almost an hour just to hide the incision itself. So where these doctors were performing the procedure in an hour, the whole thing, I'm taking an hour just to hide it. And so I follow the natural curves of the ear. Do you go a little inside? You so go a little inside the ear. That's the correct. Outside. Yeah. So you have to go at those angles. And there are certain tricks that you learn over time to hide the incision. So I invite everyone to go to my website, come in, take a look at the pictures of the facelifts. It's near impossible to see, to see the incision. Because I've seen especially people of color, mm -hmm. African American women or Hispanic women or, or Arabic women who keloid, you know, because of thicker skin. A very thin line on them might be ropey looking because of the way they heal. And, and it's not just women of, of color and ethnicities. We see Caucasian women as well that if the site is not closed correctly and there's tension on it, who the scar enlarges and it can raise up as well. It can become a hypertrophic scar. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of hairdressers out there that see it on a daily basis. And if they do, it's something that I can fix for people. All right, so another question about the scarring procedure is when you do the the lower facelift do you also go under the chin and make an incision so there? I, al I always do so the incision may be a tiny incision where I'm just doing liposuction even if somebody doesn't have a lot of fatty tissue then I'm using the liposuction cannula to basically separate the skin so the skin can be tightened so basically I'm taking this whole area and smoothing it out because when I'm bringing the skin tighter this way, I want this skin to be part of that and so I want to loosen that skin as well. So even if I'm not removing fat through this tiny incision, I'm at least loosening the skin so the skin can be, then be tightened through the facelift. And again, it's about symmetry and balance so that you look even. And again, when we were talking about a facelift sectionally, like just the lower facelift or just the eyes, mm -hmm. It doesn't look quite right when you have real tight, firm eyes and a sagging jowl or vice versa. If you have a lower facelift but you've got bags and hanging lids, it still doesn't look like a facelift. Well, I it always throws think it all off. The, the person who has a couch that's falling apart and says to the upholsterer, just fix that one pillow. You know, So they've got this one nice looking pillow and it's because they, their eye was caught by the pillow and that's why when somebody comes in, we look together in the mirror to look at the entire face. They may not be ready for that, but it's important for them to look at it so they understand why, if they're here in regard to their eyelids, I'm talking about their cheek as well. Because they're a continuum. And so, you know, yes, many times procedures can be done in isolation, but you need to at least know how the cheek affects the eyelid and how the eyelid affects the brow and how the cheek affects the lips. You want that balance of, of overall rested look mm -hmm. without tired eyes and a tight jowl. My other question is, um, again with technique, is if someone's previously had a facelift mm -hmm. when they were in their 40s or 50s, mm -hmm. and now they're in their 60s or 70s, do you go in that same incision, or if that incision was not a great one, do you create a new I one? I create a new one and try to hide the old incision. And so usually there's enough laxity from 10 or 15, 20 years ago where it's not going to look afterwards as if they have two separate incisions. There'll be, you know, one. But again, the way I do it, it should be very hard to see the incision. Okay. So. Well, now at least we know what we're dealing with with technique. And when we get back, I guess that there was some footage, some outtakes from one of our last shows that we didn't have enough time to get on. And I think it's pretty interesting. So we're going to throw that on for you to see before we say goodnight. So we'll be right back with that. What's going on in your neighborhood? They say it takes a village. It's the simple things. The things that are a testament to the old. The things that are a testament to the new. Know what's going on in your community. Check out 
our community channel on NewRadioMedia.com. Advertising your business these days can be challenging. Traditional radio and TV ads are expensive and, frankly, a bit of a crapshoot. Not to mention, the audience for over-the-air material is shrinking as more and more of us demand to see and hear what we want, when we want. Advertising on new radio media is a solution. With our live streaming programs that are also available on demand, your message is always ready when your customers are ready to watch and listen, all for a fraction of what you'd likely have been paying for other ads. NewRadioMedia.com. Call Buzz Van Houten at 248-939-9999 for more information. Do you want to see things like this? Did you just say you died? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, technically. Or maybe even something like this. We'll do nothing but destroy your corpses and burn them all for my dogs. Your dogs are gone. And sometimes, a little of this. We need to have a talk. <laughs> I take my axe and I smash it. No! <laughs> and check out Podquesters, the show where we tackle ghoulish goblins, fiendish foes, and dangerous drakes. Oh, like the singer? No, the dragon creature. Oh. Anyways, Podquesters, Fridays, only on NewRadioMedia.com. Accent your beauty. That's what we're here for. We're here to accent your natural beauty and give you the look that you really want to have. Dr. Berkowitz, our guru of facial uh, how should we say it? Facial corrections, augmentation, improvement, all the above, enhancement. 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 <laughs> He's out of the country, so we're kind of taking the wheel here and, and driving our own little machine this week. So, Sylvia, you're the person that does a lot of the injectables with the doctor, correct? Correct. So when somebody comes in and they want any kind of Botox, lip filler, mm -hmm. any kind of uh, filling in the lines, mm -hmm. whatever, they go to you and you analyze them and you say, okay, we're going to put a little here, a little there, and you fill their face till they look plump Peaceful. and good. <laughs> Beautiful, Correct. right. <laughs> now, what's Cabela? Because isn't that a procedure that you can use for tightening the neck? So Cabela is actually um, for reduction of fat of the submental area or the double chin. Okay. Um, it's a product. It's an injection. It's a de deoxycholic acid. You inject it into the fatty tissue. It's 10 milligrams of that? Yeah, 10 okay. milligrams per vial, but okay. typically one session is two, two vials. Um, and just based on our uh, patient results and just the protocol and the studies, most the majority of people require two treatments, and they're done a month apart. Okay. But we just um, we inject into the fatty tissue of the under the chin, um, and then it just breaks down the fat, and then your body flushes out the fat. Okay. What's the um, on a scale of one to ten? What's the pain ratio there for most people? I know it differs. Right. So there's no numbing agent involved. We just have the patient ice the area that we're going to inject. Um, the needles that we use are very tiny. Uh, but the product itself tends to sting as it's working, as I'm working. So the discomfort level is pretty low, and it really is just about that stinging from the product. Well, are, are you familiar with something called Fractora? I actually am not. Okay, because um, that is a similar Some. kind of a thing, but it's got a, um, a piece of equipment that's got lots of little needles in it. Uh, and they push those needles all around your neck like this and okay. this and this and this. It's not the most pleasant thing, so I'm just curious. Yeah, the the discomfort is really just the stinging of the product. Okay, it's not even a stinging. Actually, it's more it, it's more of like a burning, like yeah. a like a heat almost. So Josh, we've how treated long does him it last? That burning feeling. Just while you're injecting. While injecting, That's right oh, afterwards, okay. there's there's no discomfort. Yeah. We still have the patient ice afterwards, just for swelling purposes, yeah, right. but not for discomfort. So, two treatments a month apart mm -hmm. should really make a significant difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see that right there. Right, the it's at least two. Some people and may require more. but How much is it per treatment? So we package it as two. The two treatments yeah, a month and apart. Yeah, it's 2400 Okay, so it's roughly 1200 a piece, mm -hmm. you know, with a month break in between. Correct. And is there any kind of a guarantee with it that if, you know, you don't get results, then you get your money back or part of it back Patients or a third treatment right. or something patients do are happy with the results 
patients who may require more than two, I'll be, I'd be able to tell during our consultation. So I do let them know that okay. they may require more than two. Okay. Um, but now, two, do you get a break on the third one if you yeah. price end up? Yeah, yeah. price-wise. Yeah, up. we can still package it that yeah, way. Yeah, good. Exactly. Because I'm trying to think of how to make it affordable. So yeah. everybody with double chins can get rid of it. Triple chins probably take a little bit more than double chins. Correct. So we so. let them know that. And then also a good thing to know about this is um, because your body's flushing out these flat fat cells, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes our bodies about three to four months to fully get rid of all those fat cells that the product damaged. So your optimal results you'll see at that point, three to four months after. Okay. So you can't go in and go out and say, wow, what a no. difference. No. So it's going to take time. Correct. And there's a lot of swelling involved, so we always tell patients not to do the procedure, have it done before an event or before some before work. But we talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Never do any procedure the day before a wedding or an event. Yes. Unlikely that you're going to look perfect the next day. I did night. my first time. We okay, did you did? Oh, He's you did. What did you do? I did. So um, it's no secret. I have always struggled with my double chin. It's okay. ridiculous. Um, and as soon as we got Kybella in, I was like, Sylvia, we have to do this. I have to do this. I had a wedding the very next day, <laughs> and I already knew the risks going into it, but you know, I mean, I'm me, I'm gonna do what I wanna do anyways. And she's like, Josh, I don't think it's a good idea. And I said, do it. So she injected me, and immediately after, you start to get swelling. And for the first, what is it, like maybe three, three, four days. The first 72 mm -hmm. hours, typically. They call, it the, they call it the bullfrog. Because <laughs> what happens is this whole oh, area starts to swell. Yep. Oh no, Jackie, you did I'm not, not kidding listen. you. you. I was at a wedding listen. full of people. I have no idea. They thought you had mumps or something? I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh, God. The entire time, I looked ridiculous. <laughs> and did I, you wear a turtleneck? I didn't wear a turtleneck. I should have. <laughs> but like every time oh. I turned my head, like I could just feel it move. Oh. It was awful. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, patients you, come you back could in. See it in the pictures. Yes. Yeah, yeah pictures. patients come back oh. in for their second treatment. They're just like, that swelling. Am I going to get the same swelling? Yeah. Typically, they're, the second time around or the third time is not as bad as the first initial post treatment swelling. Oh, so do this when you're listening in, people listen to me. <laughs> do this when you have three days to stay yes. home or yes. not worry about mm -hmm. it or wear turtlenecks or whatever. <laughs> the worst thing you could do is go in and then go out the next day thinking you're going to look fabulous, right. right? Your two chins will now be four. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, you got to give this some time, yeah. time, and, time, time. Yeah. And also just for people to know that Kybella, um, it's it's meant for the submental fat, but if we find or people have little pockets of fat, we can actually treat it that way too. And I, we've had really good results with that. For instance, so what the, other areas? Can right. You so use the it little at? area that we have, the, it's not a bra roll. I don't even know. What I know what that is. that, that the little, little chicken fatty fat that's yeah. right at the top where yeah. your arm meets your the smaller breast. pockets yeah. of fat. Um, we've also had a patient who had a small bulge on her outer thigh, didn't want to go through lipo for it. So we started treating the bulge on her thigh. It was just a tiny area, but um, I, th I think we did three sessions for her for that. Art, and I have a question, and I think I know the answer, but what about the fat deposits under your eye when you hit? Is that too sensitive an area for Kybella? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that needs more control. So something like surgical, what Dr. Berkowitz does. Yeah, to you probably you have, to have to remove that pocket yes, of fat. You have to be very careful with that. Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I think under the eyes is probably one of the most delicate mm -hmm. parts of, of your face. Yeah. So you want to be really careful, even with products that you put under your eyes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't want to use the real drying things like the Retin-A's. Now, right. the the product that we had on before, Jamie, that uh, um, Julie mentioned for under the eyes. That's a good one. The Regenica. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Regenica is good. You like that one? I like that eye cream. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now with eye cream. Do you use it on top of your serums and moisturizers, or do you use that separate and then put the other stuff, other parts of your skin? I always wondered, do you treat the eye area separately? We should treat the eye area separately, yeah. You'd have to find out. It depends on the serum you're using. It may be able to be used under the eye. Some can't be, but um, it, the eye cream should just go on on its own. So you right should there. use eye cream around the eyes. And all the other tighteners and moisturizers the rest. on the rest of your face. Because it's such a delicate area, yes. like you said. So. This is like a, a real procedure here, guys. I mean, yeah. you have to really spot even applying, check your whole Even face. applying the way you apply um, eye cream, you're supposed to use your ring finger because it's the weakest finger. So And you less, just pat it. Yeah. You don't rub it in. Yeah. But your other moisturizers, you kind of yeah, rub in and mm -hmm. smooth. So you really have to take care of that area mm -hmm. under your eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, does, in your opinion, 
does um, Botox in the corners help reduce some of those little wrinkles on the side of the eye? Oh, absolutely. Botox is great. It's, it's my favorite product, but <laughs> um, it's really good for under the or around the eyes. Underneath, directly underneath the eye, you can only inject it so far in, well, but it'll aren't soften. There, aren't the there products. other certain products? Um, I don't know if it's Juvederm mm -hmm. or what's the other one? Tesla? Um, Volatero, maybe? And there's Versa, yeah. right? Versa, So yeah. some of the other products um, are better to be injected under the eye in that tissue? Yeah, because it's um, a thin area, so you need a very thin filler to use under that area, too. Okay, so the... Um, consistency of it has to be so Thinner, fine that it yeah. comes in a teeny little needle. Basically. Some of them are thicker, right? Mm -hmm. And they need a bigger needle. Um, it's more like the product itself is going to look too heavy under the eye. Or it could or lump up or something. Or lump up. Yes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. This is all important stuff it because is. we all want to look as good as we can. And fillers are very important nowadays. I mean, it seems like everybody I know gets fillers mm -hmm. over the age of 50, even younger, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 20s. Please. Now, why would a beautiful girl in her 20s need fillers? To fill what? Well, I mean, some people just have genetic reasons for it. For instance, hollowness under the eye or dark circles. I mean, I or was even just telling Sylvia the other day, I actually had sent her a side-by-side -side of myself, like, before I started here and mm -hmm. then um, now post-second baby. I was looking at this, I was like, oh my God, I text Sylvia right away, I'm like, Sylvia, mm -hmm. filler, and my nasolabial fold, ASAP, yeah. or and my and cheek it's really, area. For her, for Danielle, mm -hmm. um, it's two pregnancies later, she's lost volume in her face, so mm -hmm. when you lose that kind of volume, you want to restore it, and you restore it wow. with filler. I, I never really thought that girls started in their 20s, um, but I look at you all, and you all have, don't have a line on your faces, not a single line, your foreheads are like, Landing fields, you can put a plane on them. <laughs> landing mean, fields. Seriously, there's not That's I a mean, great compliment. That's the best I mean, compliment. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're awesome. Fields. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, you look at people who have these perfect faces, they look like a doll. You know, there's not a mark on it, not a discoloration, not a line. And that's attainable, I guess, if you start young and start Absolutely. layering mm -hmm. the products and Practice. you always look that good. Mm -hmm. But what do you do for a person that comes in and they're 60 years old and they have sun damage, they have older skin, mm -hmm. they have a lot of lines, they have their lines on their forehead and the yeah. little 11 there right in the middle of their yeah. nose and eyebrows. And Where do you start? Well, you take like a multi-faceted approach. Like you have to take care of the volume, but you also have to take care of the skin. So it's where Josh would come in. Um, if it's something surgical, obviously Dr. Mm -hmm. Berkowitz. So sometimes you do have to... to you have to start with realistic expectations. Yeah, you know? and just, just throw in a package yeah. and tell them. And what. really, just like, and a lot of it too. I mean, like you had mentioned earlier, price point. Mm -hmm. How far are you willing to go? And like, is if it's that important to you, are you really willing to spend that extra money on going to surgical? Mm -hmm. Are there certain procedures? I know if your upper lids are preventing you from seeing clearly and reading, that's covered. Correct. By Correct. insurance, usually yeah. that's covered. Okay, so are there any other procedures that any of you do that are? Covered by insurance? No, don't typically think so. no, no, no. Mm -mm. See, that's the problem with healthcare in this country. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Brazil. Brazil, the government pays for everything, right? Mm. Anything you do, plastic surgery, the government will pay for oh, it. Oh God, I, I think we, I think I we would be on like a look five year waiting list. I mean, I know. they want they want their people to be the most beautiful in the world, and they will. You could take your babies in and get their noses fixed. I heard. I don't know oh, if it's my. really that young, but <laughs> it's a very very cosmetically conscious country and they they support that jeez i need to move to and brazil that's what i'm saying right a great mm -hmm. place to move when you get older just even for six months Absolutely. right get it, all, get it all done and come get back right yeah. <laughs> all right so sylvia you brought a product in i did yeah. and i want to know what it is because i'm just um getting filled with all this good information on all these products so is that a sample so <laughs> <laughs> obviously not. Okay. Um, so tell me about this. So I'll, it's with our product line. Put it on line. my wish list. <laughs> it's our last in is the product line, and I brought this. It's the restorative net complex. And since we were speaking about Kybella, some patients come in, um, especially our older patients. They feel like if we remove some of that fatty tissue, they're just going to have loose, saggy skin. And depending on the person, some people have already some loose skin. So I would be cautious about treating their neck with Kybella because it could cause that. But um, most people 
they're fine with it. It's not an issue. But when they still have kind of an insecurity about the the laxity of their skin, this is a great product. It's um, it's with the Trihex technology, which Elast and all their products have. It's going to build collagen. It's going to tighten the skin. It's going to hydrate the neck. So it's specifically made for the skin of the neck. And you put this on at night and yeah. in the morning. Uh, you can put it on morning and night, correct. And it will help tighten up your mm-hmm. neck. Yes. Oh. Well, this so, one, uh, it's a great compliment to use to a treatment like Kybella or just if you want some. Okay, tightness. so if you can't afford the Kybella or are afraid of the pain or the discomfort or whatever, this will still help you, right? With, can't with tightness. Ky- okay, so Kybella is not a tightening Right, it product. just removes, it just removes the, the fat. fat. Yeah. And, but this will tighten what's this there. Will, yes, absolutely. And did you tell us how much this is yet? The p- Do we know the price on this one uh, here? I don't even know. I think it was, this it was is Julie. around 250 Oh, this is a pricey one here. Mm-hmm. So this must really work on the neck. Mm-hmm. If it's for $250, I would think this works really well, right? Mm-hmm. So it does. It really does. So you've seen befores and afters of people that have been doing this. So how much time does it take normally till you would see results from the tightening? I mean, any skin product, I feel like you would, a month, I would say, at least, at least a month, at least. To okay, see some so results. you can't just do something and then the next day walk no. outside and say, yeah. wow, look at the difference. It's like mm-hmm. anything else. It's going to take time for your skin to accept it, soak it's it in. It's turning over. And it's creating new cells. So, yeah, it takes a, about a month. To and see and how long will this size last you typically? If you use it twice a day, what would you say you can get out of this? I mean, I would say you could probably get easily at least a good two, three months out of three it. Three months, I would oh, say. You know, you sure. don't need a lot of product. No. A little bit goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's nice it comes with a pump mm-hmm. to know digging of fingers oh, into that's a jar. What I like. yeah. yeah, especially yeah. when you have nails. Mm-hmm. Yes, it all and gets you don't know which nails, way to go with right. nails. Yeah. You have to use the back of your thumb exactly. to scoop it out. Yeah, so that's Amazing. great. That's a good product. Yeah. And does this company have other products also besides this one, or is this their go-to product? No, they have a whole line of products from eye creams to face moisturizers. So again, we're back to the eye creams. Mm-hmm. So which, in your opinion... Everybody has their favorite products here. What's your favorite eye cream? I just started using the, I love the Regenica eye cream. I just started using the Elastin eye cream maybe about two weeks ago. So I can't really say for sure, but it's hydrating. It's really nice. I like a dewy, hydrated eye area. (laughs) So (laughs) they both provide that. I just have only used this for about two weeks, so I wouldn't really be able to say. Now, have you all done that hydrofacial? Mm -hmm. All of you have had that? Now, how Mm -hmm. often can you get that? I mean, depending on, you know, how deep and how aggressive we go, I do it for patients, you know, anywhere from twice a week, uh, like once every two weeks to maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once a month is a good Mm -hmm. period to space them out and Mm -hmm. get that kind of skin that you want. Mm -hmm. And then when you come in for the hydrofacial, will you then analyze their skin at the same time and tell them what products are good? absolutely, every single time. Um, Any patient who comes in for skincare concerns, I always like to treat them like it's the first time they're coming in. Even if I've been seeing them for years. Um, okay, because there's changes in our skin. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know? Whether from the environment or from pregnancy mm-hmm. or What from does their stress? skin look like that day? That's uh-huh. what I'm treating is how their skin looks that day. That's great. So, yeah, absolutely. Every time I want to talk about, you know, what kind of products you're using. How's your skin doing? Is it dry? Is it oily? You know, are you experiencing any type of breakouts? You know, is anything going on in your life that may cause, you know, uh, flare-ups of rosacea or, you know, whatever it may be. So do, do these facials help with rosacea and things like that? Or do you need other products for when you have discoloration, you know, and, and rosaceas, red blotches, right. you can get them wherever. Yeah. What's the best thing for that? Um, you know, I don't think hydrofacials are the best thing for that personally. I think something like IPL is amazing along with great skin care. Um, I've seen incredible results with rosacea from doing a combination of those things. Okay, because basically that's – kind of harder to cover with makeup if you have a lot of that redness Mm -hmm. you know and you have to learn all the different colors because I learned that there's different colors to cover different things Mm -hmm. like there's the green tints Mm -hmm. and there's the yellows Mm -hmm. for different kinds of bruising Mm -hmm. so that's a whole other show of how to the color wheel the color wheel wheel. wheel. and you know some people have more pink in their skin some have more yellow in their skin and so on so you analyze that as well, correct? Absolutely. So you'll tell them what tones they have and undertones. See, all of that stuff is so important. Just even if you're not getting any procedure done but a facial, mm-hmm. at least you'll know what the right makeup and skin products are for your skin. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love this, and I think every woman, and, and men too, do you do a lot of men as well? Of mm -hmm. course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say the number of men, has patient, male patients, over the years. oh, absolutely. I it's love crazy. That. I love those metrosexual men. <laughs> All right. Doctor, my eyes have seen the years. Well, I hope you found that interesting. I did. I learned something every week. We're going to be back next week and get to the rest of your questions, or at least as many of them as we can. So stay beautiful, and we'll see you back here with Dr. Berkowitz in one week. Dr. Maya.